Hi, this is David with David's Tutorials. In today's video, I'm going to tell you how to raise perfect children. Now, I know when you hear that, everybody's going to laugh and they're going to say, there's no such thing as perfect children. And you're absolutely right. There is no such thing as perfect children. But I'm here to tell you, I'm going to tell you 12 points that if you obey the five rules and seven guidelines that I'm going to share with you, you will give yourself the absolute best chance of raising perfect children, or as good as they can be. Let's get started. Now, right off the bat, I want to tell you that I want this to be a discussion. What that means, if you're not watching this right now on the YouTube platform, go ahead and click on the YouTube logo in one of the bottom corners, and that will take you to the YouTube platform right at this point in the video. And at that point, you can then go to the discussion section down below and leave a comment whenever I say something and you have something to say about that point. I want to hear about it. So leave us comments in the discussion section down below. Now, let's get on with the points I need to make. Rule number one is always love your child unconditionally. By that, I mean you always love the child as a person, even if you do not love what they do or what they say or how they act. You love them as a person and you let them know that with no conditions attached. We're going to get into that a little bit, I'm sure, in the discussion. But what if my child does blah, blah, blah? You love them anyway. As I heard it said by a mentor, love the person, hate the sin. And in this case, it doesn't have to be a sin. It can be misbehavior. It could be sassing back. It could be anything that is not appropriate. But you love the person. You don't like their behavior sometimes. Okay, we're going to get into other ones as we get going along. Rule number two, and this is for you as a parent or as a teacher or as an employee or a boss or any kind of a supervisor, scout leader, whatever it is, you must suppress your own selfishness. It is so sad that most of today's society is ruled by selfishness and greed. And you see this every day, people trying to cut in line, people honking their horn because you inconvenience them, people stealing, lying, cheating. They do this because they're selfish and they're greedy and they only care about themselves. And you need to suppress this. If you have a child or are in charge of a child, you need to suppress your selfishness. Instead, supplant your selfishness with your concern for the child. Rule number one, love that child unconditionally, and you replace it with concern for what you're trying to accomplish with that child. And we're going to get to what you're trying to accomplish in some more of these rules. So rule number two, suppress your selfishness. Rule number three is establish values. Now, all of these rules, rules number one, two, three, and four that you're going to hear in just a second, all of these rules are more important the younger the child is. We're not talking about infancy when they are six months or less because they're basically just programming their peripherals, as my son would say. Yeah, he's wiggling his hands. He's writing the drivers for his peripherals. But... You don't need to worry about it, but anytime they become a person, they become aware of you, then you need to establish values. You know what this means, don't you? This means you have to live these values that you're establishing. I am 99% sure that everybody watching this video believes that it's wrong to lie, to cheat, to steal, to hurt somebody else. These are values. These are morals. These are things that you must instill in your child from the very first day. And the best way to do it is to live these values. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't steal. You don't hurt another person. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. You have integrity. These are the values that you must instill in your child from the very first day they can understand it. That's rule number three. Don't break that rule. Rule number four is set boundaries and stick to them. Now, by this, I mean you have to set limits. 
You say what the child can do and what they cannot do, and you establish this in advance so that you know how far the child can go, what they can do, what they can say, how they can behave, and when they go beyond that, then that's the end of it. You have to stop them. You have to keep them from violating these boundaries. Now, one of the things that you have to understand, and this is a future rule, is it's part of a child's job all the way up through the point when they're leaving home to test the limits. Anybody who has had a child will agree. One of the jobs of being a child is to test the limits, to see how far they can go, and then see what happens if they violate those limits. So you, as a parent, as a teacher, as a preacher, as a boss, as a scout leader, as any kind of a person in charge of a child, needs to set the boundaries and stick to them. Now, this is not to say that you cannot allow occasional violations or milder consequences for violating the boundaries. But it does mean that you don't make the violation of the boundaries the rule rather than the exception. If, for example, your boundary is you don't go out in the yard unless an adult is present with you, mommy or daddy preferably, or maybe grandma or grandpa. So if the child then goes out in the yard on their own, you might not want to have such a severe consequence. You don't want to, for example, spank them for that on their first violation. You might want to just give them a talking to and say, because you violated this boundary, you're going to have to go stand in the corner. You're going to have to have a timeout for one minute. And you knew this was wrong and you did it anyway, so you're going to have to have a timeout. And you are having this boundary and sticking to it. On the other hand, if they go out in the yard because the dog was in trouble and they wanted to go out and rescue the dog, you might make an exception for that. Now, this is a rule, but not a hard and fast rule. So you're going to set boundaries and you're going to stick to them, and you're going to use good judgment to decide when to let something go without a consequence. And it may be that the consequence is just talking to them and making sure they know you understand why they did what they did. And in this case, but no other I'm going to go ahead and let that go because I understand why you did that and it was a good thing you did. This will reinforce them making their own judgment call. And that's one of the things that as they get older, you need to be sure they can do is have good judgment. That's not a rule. That's not even a guideline. That's one of the things, one of the goals that you need to have for this child. Your goal is for them to learn to exercise good judgment. And one of the ways to do that is by setting boundaries and sticking to them. That's rule number four. Now let's go ahead and get into the guidelines. The last rule is number 12, and we'll get to that at number 12. And it is the most important. So stay tuned for rule number 12, but let's get into guideline, which is point number five. Point number five is a guideline, which means establish consequences in advance for what if you violate your boundaries? What if you violate something I told you to do? Establish them in advance. Now, one of the things you will know just intuitively is that you cannot foresee every single happenstance, everything that's going to happen when they might violate one of the guidelines and the boundaries that you have set. And you can't foresee that, so you can't set consequences. But for example, when you're setting a boundary, okay, you're three years old, you do not go out in the yard unless there's an adult present. If you go out in the yard and there's no adult present, then you're going to have a time out for at least one minute. And they know in advance what's going to happen if they violate that. This gives the child a level of confidence that you're not going to beat them half to death with a wet noodle or doing anything. It's the unknown that creates terror frequently. And if the child knows they broke your rule and, oh, I'm in trouble now, mama's going to kill me, they will know, oh, I went out in the yard and I'm going to get a timeout, that will give them some reassurance and let them be a lot more confident in your parenting, in your mentorship, in your teaching, in your, your bossship, if you will. Okay, so establish the consequences in advance as much as possible. And if it can't be an exact consequence, then make it a generic consequence. I remember one time when my son was about four or five years old and he did something 
that to that child was an egregious sin. He his eyes got white and he said, Am I gonna get a spanking? And I don't know where it came from, but I'm very grateful that it did because at that point it just came out of my mouth without me thinking about it. I said, I will never spank you unless you lie to me or if you hurt another person on purpose. And I left it at that. And I could see the expression wash over his face. It was not only great relief at the fact that he wasn't going to get a spanking for this situation, but in the future, he would know that he could do this other misbehavior and it would not result in a spanking. So that would be an issue. Now, when they're younger, they won't understand future consequences. You know, somebody who is uh, 20 months old, they won't understand if you do this, then you will get a spanking. Uh, when they're that young, you're establishing consequences not to tell the child, but in your own mind. You're establishing consequences so you know what your boundaries are. Now, you remember rule number four is to set boundaries. You're not just setting them for the child. You're setting them for yourself. And when it comes to establishing consequences, you need to set your own boundaries. For example, you need to set your own mind right now. When the child is young, I am not ever going to spank them unless they do something that is a bad danger safety issue. For example, uh, I had a daughter that was going to go play with an electric socket. Now that is a very bad danger vulnerability and you do not want your child to play anywhere near an electric socket, especially if you don't have these little plugs that the child can't get out. You never can tell. They might pick up a metal fingernail file or something else and say, oh, this looks like a nice hole and stick it in there. It could kill them, and you don't want that. It's a safety issue. So what I did when the child was reaching for that electric socket, I was across the room, and I didn't want to jump up and run over there and scream. I just made a klaxon sound. And it was nice and loud. And the little girl at that time, she's probably 18 months old, she went, and she looked around, and it startled her, and it didn't make her cry but it made her understand that what she was about to do was a no-no. An 18-month-old could do that. I had to do that one more time. And you know, she never approached an electrical socket again until she was old enough to understand what they were. So establishing a consequences for various violations and establishing your own boundaries in your mind for what these consequences are going to be is a great thing to do if you want to raise more perfect children. Guideline number six is to allow natural consequences. Now, this is a guideline. It's not a rule. Natural consequences mean if you see that they're going to do something and it's going to cause them some inconvenience, some even some pain, you need to consider, do you want to go ahead and let it happen? Because sometimes experience is the best teacher. One of the things that I like to say about my wife and myself, is that when our two kids were growing up, my tendency was when there was a rock in the path that they were going down, I would talk to them and I would say, there's a rock in that path. You want to be careful so you don't stub your toe. And if they stub their toe, then they would learn. Now, what my wife would do she would say to them, oh, there's a rock in the path. Here, let me steer you around that rock so that you don't stub your toe. That's different styles of parenting. And you know, I think both of them have a place in a child's life. They need to know that a parent cares enough about them to keep them from getting hurt, but they also need to know that the child trusts them enough to make their own decisions and that if they make the wrong decision after we told them about what to watch out for, they will suffer the consequence. Okay, this is what I'm talking about in guideline number six, which is to allow natural consequences. Again, use good judgment as a parent, as a supervisor, as a teacher, as a mentor, as a preacher. Whatever it is, allow natural consequences as long as it doesn't result in injury to the child. Minor pain, okay. So I told you not to do this. You did this. You hurt your knee. I'm sorry, but now you know. And again, rule number one, 
love them unconditionally. Oh, I'm so sorry you got hurt by that, but I told you about that, and I'm sorry you had to skin your knee by doing what I told you not to do, but at least now you know, and you won't do it again, right? You're right, but they know that you love them. You love them as a person. You might not enjoy their behavior, what they did, and you're very sad that they disobeyed you, and they're even more sad that they got a little bit hurt from it, but you're allowing the natural consequences. This, I tell you, more than just about anything else, will help them develop responsibility when they become adults, knowing that there will be consequences, that they will not always be protected. Guideline number seven, and this is one of the most important, of course, they're all important or they wouldn't be here on this list, but this is one of the most important and the most neglected, and that is catch them doing something right. It is so tempting as a parent, as a teacher, as a Sunday school class leader, as a boss to only find the things to criticize. And think about it. How many times have you been in a situation when the only thing you heard was criticism, was correction, was cut down, was telling you how bad you are and how you're doing things wrong? You don't need that, but more importantly, your child doesn't need that. So make it a point to always catch them doing something right, to praise them, to edify them, to build them up, to say, wow, you did a great job with that. Now, you know exactly what I'm talking about when a four-year-old brings you a crayon drawing and they say, look at this, mommy, isn't this beautiful? And you look and you, what is it? Oh, it's so beautiful, I'm going to put it on my refrigerator. Or you can just talk with them about it and let them tell you all about it because sometimes them telling you about it is even more important than them giving it to you. But catch them doing something right and praise them for it. Now, here's the guideline for you. The guideline is you need to try to catch them doing something right and tell them about it 10 times for every criticism, for every correction. Anytime you want to tell them, oh, do it this way instead, you need to have already caught them doing something right and praise them 10 times. It's hard to do. Matter of fact, it's nearly impossible to do, and it's something you got to work on. But catch them doing something right, make it a habit, do it 10 times for every criticism or correction, and I promise your child will be better for it. That's guideline number seven. Guideline number eight is really more for you than it is for the child, and that is to expect age-appropriate behavior. Now, the question I ask myself, and it helped me immeasurably as my kids were growing up, is what's the job of whatever age they were? For example, what's the job of an 18-month-old? And you think about it for a second, and you say, well, the job of an 18-month-old is to make noise, to make a mess, to get things out and leave them out, hey, you know, they're doing a really good job of being an 18-month-old. And when I realize that, no matter what my level of frustration with what they had done, it always calmed me down. So ask yourself the question, what's the job of a, put in their age here, child? What's the job of a 20-month-old child? Well, their job, of course, is to make noise, to make a mess, to get into everything, to complain and get this, to say no to everything. <laughs> That's just their job at that age. They're feeling their way. They're feeling their oats. They're discovering who they are. You need to reinforce who they are and make them feel good about who they are, not cut them down. You need to always catch them doing something right. You understand their age-appropriate behavior and that will help you settle down. It will alleviate any level of frustration you might have with putting up with who they are at that age. Now think about it for the various ages. You got the infancy, that's like six months and younger. What's the job of an infant? Well, basically to eat, to make a dirty diaper, and to complain when they're uncomfortable. That's all there is to it. Go through each of the other ages. What's it? job of a baby, which is like age six months until they start moving around, and they've got a different set of job description items, and what's the job of a 
a toddler, basically from the time they get mobile until the time they start really talking. And then what's the job of a preschooler? What's the job of a kindergarten age kid? What's the job of an elementary age kid? They all have different job descriptions for being that age. Think in your head, what are these job descriptions and how you're going to react to each one of them? Rule number one, love them unconditionally. Rule number, was it? You set boundaries. I don't even remember the rules by number, but you're going to have to set boundaries and set the consequences for violating your boundaries. The younger they are, the less intense the consequences they are. You know all this. We don't need to get into that. But you need to remember always rule, excuse me, guideline number eight is to expect age-appropriate behavior. Now, guideline number nine is to talk to your children as though they are adults, not just kids. Yeah, you can talk to them like they're kids, but I think at least half the time you need to talk to them as though they were a lot smarter than they seem to be. And this will do two things. Number one, it will show you respect them as a person, an individual, that you respect their thoughts and opinions, that even if you don't go along with what they think or opine, you ask them about it. And one of the examples I have of this, it surprised me greatly at the time, is when my son was five years old, we had had a 1978 Oldsmobile Cutlass, which was a two-door, and it was getting kind of old, and I wanted to go ahead and get a little bit newer car. And so I went out, and I saw the ad in the paper for a Buick Riviera. I said, ooh, Buick Riviera is probably a big sedan. It's four-door. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. I'm going to go look at it. And I went and I looked at it, and I fell in love with it, and I bought it. And on the way home, I realized, uh-oh, it's only a two-door car. And I got it home, and, of course, the kids, they came running out. They wanted to see the new car. It was a used car, but they wanted to see the new car. And they were looking at it. And said, oh, this is so neat. We love the car. Oh, we love it. It had one of the very first computer screens in it that was digital and uh, had everything on the screen and digital. And, that, you know, wow, this is great. And I said to the kids, I said, well, you know, I was thinking I might need to take it back because our family is getting bigger. You guys are getting bigger. And I thought we needed a four-door car, and this is really only a two-door car. And my five-year-old son looked at me, and he said, well, the last car we had was a two-door, and we didn't have any problem with that. Out of the mouths of children comes some of the greatest wisdom you will ever hear. So talk to your kids like they're adults, not just as kids. And you will be better for it. They will be better for it. And I think your kids will be much better as they get older and become adults on their own. That was guideline number nine. Do I need to tell you this? Guideline number 10, have fun. Have fun in life. Have fun with learning. Have fun with interaction between parents and kids. Always rule number one, love them unconditionally. Give them a lot of hugs. Give them a lot of uh, joking say things that are just a little bit off. Um, we had great fun one time when my two kids came home from preschool in Alabama having a serious discussion about whether our pet was a dog or a dog. <laughs> now in Alabama, the Alabama accent, they would call a canine a dog. And to the two kids at age but three or four, they thought they were two different words. And so they were having, well, our dog, our pet is a dog. No, it's a dog. And so we had a good laugh about how people said different things in different ways. Another example of that was they were probably four and five years old. And I had this great big old empty cardboard box. Uh, and it was coming up on Christmas time. Now, my wife is a CPA and she was working full time coming up to Christmas. And so it was a Saturday, and she was having to go in and start doing the pre-tax season catch-up. And I was home with the kids, and I saw this cardboard box, and I saw the kids, and I had this idea. I said, hey, kids, let's play a joke on mom, okay? Tell you what we're going to do. And so I cut the top out of the cardboard box, and I took the flaps on the bottom, and I folded them up on the inside. I said, okay, I'm going to take this wrapped up box. Notice the paper on top. There's only paper. There's no box. And what we're going to do, uh, just before mom comes home, I'm going to have you guys crouch down on the floor. I'm going to put the box over you. I want you to take the flaps and 
get them down on the floor from all four sides and you stand, you, you sit on those flaps. And then when your mom comes in the door, I'll say, hey, we've got a, a surprise for you. And when I say that, you can pop out of the box and be a surprise for mom. And they just thought this was a great idea and great fun. And they laughed and laughed and laughed. And we did that. And they got in the box and they, they very properly got to sit on the flap so that when they stood up, the box wouldn't rise up with them. And Jan came in the door and she looked and I said, guess what we've got? And she looked over and she saw this big box on the floor. And the box giggled. <laughs> she knew what was in the box. I, I knew right then that the surprise was lost. There's no surprise anymore. But I said it anyways. We've got a surprise for you. And the kids, they popped out of the box, of course, bursting the paper. And they just thought that was great fun. But the guideline number 10 here is have fun. If the kids have fun, they're just going to enjoy being kids and they're going to respect their parents, their mentors, even more than they already do. Okay, guideline number 10, have fun. Guideline number 11, yeah, we're coming down the home stretch here. And this is going to lead to rule number 12. Guideline number 11 is they will misbehave. And the guideline is this, handle misbehavior with logic. Okay, if you have already established boundaries, if you have already set the consequences for violating the boundaries and the rules, and I told you to do this and you didn't do this, you did some other thing, establish handling misbehavior with logic. This means don't get out of control, don't react. Think about it before you handle any misbehavior. Now, one of the things that my son now does with his kids, and I think it's an absolutely wonderful idea, is when the kid misbehaves, and yes, all kids misbehave, he will sit down with them and talk about it. Not only will he talk about it, he will outline what the guideline was that they violated, why the guideline was in place, and ask them what do they think is the appropriate consequence for violating that guideline. Now, a great example of this was when I caught my son when he was eight, nine years old, in bed at night, under the covers, reading a book with a flashlight. <laughs> now, this is something pretty much all kids do. And if you don't teach your kids to love reading, you're missing a big bet. They need to love reading to the point that they're willing to violate a guideline to do more reading. Well, he was reading under the covers with a flashlight, and I did not have a plan in place ahead of time how to handle that. So uh, basically, I, bas I just took away the flashlight and I took away the book, and I said, we're going to talk about this in the morning. And what we said was, okay, your bedtime was 9 o'clock, and I caught you at 11 o'clock. So tonight, you violated it by two hours. You're going to have to go to bed two hours earlier. No flashlight, no book. Oh, okay, but he understood the logic in that. But what he does now with his kids, guess what his kids are doing? They're going under the covers with a flashlight, reading a book after their bedtime. He will talk to them in the morning and he will say, well, this is why we have a bedtime for you. And they will discuss it and he'll say, now, you're violating this guideline, number one, it makes me not trust you as much as I want to be able to. And number two, it hurts you the next day when you have things to do. And they talk about why the guideline is in place and what happens if you violate it. And then they talk about the consequences. Now, it's always a good idea if you don't have established and advanced consequences to let the child talk about what the consequences should be. Sometimes they're going to come out with something that is horribly too severe. And other times they'll come out with something that's horribly not severe enough. Like, Oh, I think I ought to get beat with a cat of nine tails. Ah, no, we don't do that in this family. Oh, I think you ought to say that I should not be able to eat red jelly beans for the next month. It's like, are you kidding me? But you need to talk with them and eventually you will agree on what the consequence should be. And when you do that, then what's going to happen is the child will understand what they did wrong, why it's wrong, what the consequence would be, and the fact that they have a say in what the consequence should be. 
it helps greatly. But rule, excuse me, guideline number 11 is to handle misbehavior with logic. And that leads us right to the last point, which is a rule. And this is rule number 12 applies to you as much as it applies to the child. And you have to demonstrate this. You have to learn to control your emotions. Both you as the parent, the teacher, the preacher, the boss, control your emotions. The child needs to learn to always control their emotions. This is not to say you can't have emotions. Everybody has emotions, and it's okay to have them, and it's okay to express them. But you cannot let the emotion govern your behavior. This is so important, and I cannot stress it enough. Do not let your emotions control your behavior. If you don't control your emotions, then your emotions will control you. And you don't want to have that happen because I promise you, if you react emotionally 99 times out of 10, you're going to regret it. And anybody you react to with this will regret it as well. So do not let your emotions control you. You control your emotions. And that's a rule, always. That's all I've got. Now, I need some discussion. Whatever you think about any of these rules, I would appreciate your feedback on any of these 12 rules, guidelines, points. Tell me what you think of them. Tell me if you know of a rule that I left out. Tell me if you think one of these rules is inappropriate. In any case, I think it'd be very appropriate if you would leave me a thumbs up to let me and the YouTube robots know that you thought this was a very valuable video. Also, if you think it's worthwhile, and I hope you do, Share this video with as many other people as you can. They need to hear it. If they're a parent, if they're going to become a parent, if they're a boss, if they're a teacher, if they're a scout leader, if they're a preacher, anything, they need to see this video. So share it with them. And as always, if you're a subscriber, thank you so much. I appreciate every single one of you. And if you're not a subscriber, it's a good idea right now to go ahead and click that subscribe button and then the bell icon. And YouTube will let you know by email when I post another wonderful video right here on the David's Tutorials channel and vlog. In the meantime, everybody, have yourself wonderful days and I will see you in the next video. Take care, everybody.